Oh, we're live. We were live. It's a Dom problem, not an us problem. But uh, anyways, guys, happy Tech Tuesday. Tech Tuesday is where we tech out on a Tuesday. But today, it's the Maverick R XRS that we're going to be talking about. Went out and rode it this morning, and uh, we're going to have a review for you on it from what we've seen so far. In order to do that, got to go over Justin Smith. Thanks, Steve. Appreciate it. Yes, today is all about the Maverick R. And yes, we had a chance to drive it quite a bit. When I say we, um, kind of all of us. I mean, uh, myself, John has already had a, his own experience in his own car in different spots. Uh, Dom was driving, Mitch was driving, Ernie was driving, kind of everybody had a chance at it. Um, put about four or five hours on it this morning so it's fresh in our heads so we can talk to you about it today. We've made a small list on the board, which is kind of left-hand leaning, um, crooked old guy writing, John. But <clears throat> thanks for doing the board so we didn't have to do it, by the way, appreciate that. You can raise your hand. He's over there. He's the one with the bad hand penmanship. He's got a new shirt. <laughs> yeah. yeah, good job. Thanks, man. Appreciate that. A little dusty. But take a look at this thing. All right, new Mav R sitting in the shop. This is the one we were driving earlier today. It is an XRS smart shock version. Um, there are non-live shock versions. There's a couple others as well. John's probably the expert on that one. I tend to not look at the list of options on the board of musical treats with Can-Am and just go straight to the fun one that we're going to play with the most and drive that around. That's probably bad on this my This is part. the top of the line one. This one, top of the line one, all the electronics, all, this, all the shock options, um, wheel and tire option. What else is on there, John? You're, you're going to be the guy for this one. Uh, the infotainment is not included on the lowest level. Okay. There's four trim levels. Okay. The bottom two are Fox QS3. Mm -hmm. uh, then we've got uh, Fox Bypass <coughs> RC2 and mm -hmm. then and smart, smart shop. Um, what other options are there on like wheel, tire, or interior? Anything that you're the top with? two levels have 16-inch wheels mm -hmm. with 32-inch tires. The bottom two levels are a 15-inch wheel with a 30-inch tire. Awesome. Thanks. Since you're talking about 32-inch tire on this one, um, everybody's concerned about what kind of clearance you've got right here between the tire and the and the upper spindle knuckle upper arm joint right here. Uh, 35s definitely fit. Um, Phil Burton had 35s on his the other day with uh, only a one inch offset out, out wider. Didn't seem to matter and there was plenty of room. So I honestly think that a, a taller than a 35 inch tire would fit in here depending on the wheel option. Uh, maybe not a 37, but definitely like a really tall 35 or a 37 that measured like a 36 well, would probably fit. And as long as you're here talking about this, it's really easy to talk about the knuckle and the um, kingpin inclination on this True. and wheel offset. True. So if you come straight from the front, Josh, and kind of look directly at the center of this tire. So everybody's talking about the upper arm and the visual of all, all, all this, and everybody can have your own opinion on whether you like that, whether you don't. The reality is what's being accomplished here is with a taller spindle, you're dropping all the loads that are put on the spindle, both inward towards the arm, forward and backward when you hit the brakes, um, because there's about 3,500 pounds of force on the upper ball joint when you hit the brakes on one of these with 32s or 33s on it, but that drops down about 80% less when you get up to the upper on a taller spindle like this. Also, um, the extra height and less load getting thrown into the chassis helps with turning. And one, one thing this car does really well compared to the previous X3 and some of the other uh, uh, models on, on the market, it definitely turns without lifting up an inside tire much faster, much sharper than previous models. It's actually very noticeable. We'll get into that when we talk about suspension and performance. But if you take a look, imagine uh, uh, an imaginary line right through the center of this upper joint, straight through the tire, and you can't see it from where you're at, but also straight through the lower ball joint where this lower control arm and spindle hit, which is also in the center of the tire. So basically the line right down the middle of this tire to the ground. That's your kingpin inclination angle. Usually that angle is about five to seven degrees inward. On this design, uh, we've talked with the engineers at Can-Am, it is actually zero kingpin inclination. Well, by doing that, a couple things happen. One, you end up with a lot less kickback in the wheel when you hit rocks or ridges or some sort of rain rut. Um, you, when you turn in, 
Um, it has a lot less load on the wheel. The power steering has less load on it. The rack and pinions take less load. Um, but the negative is that you have less feel when you load into a corner because when you have a kinkpin inclination, so let's say five degrees or so, when you turn the tire, it actually leans slightly, leans inward on the inside as you turn in and leans in on the outside. So when it rolls over, it's actually a flat tire. That load, you feel in the wheel as getting a little bit rougher and you can kind of feel how you wanna turn into corners. You can feel when the car wants to break loose or not. With this system, you may not have that feel, <clears throat> but what you don't have is ever having the wheel rip out of your hand. It doesn't matter what you're gonna hit. Um, we put it through the paces today in all of our test areas. Um, guys are loop boulders, uh, a few other spots. These are areas where a lot of trophy trucks test. Whoops are fairly big, fairly sharp. The rocks are very big and sharp, and we try and blow through there trying to see what this feels like. And there's really no issue with the steering on this because of this design. Can-Am also, in talking with the engineers, had tested multiple designs over here. Um, more angle, shorter arm package, less angle, um, all of in an effort to try and get the lowest feedback possible and kick back into the steering so that your driving experience is the easiest it could possibly be. So having go, gone through all of those tests, they ended up with this because you can drive it with two fingers through the roughest of terrain as we did today. So for that reason, I think they killed it. Um, on the visual side, that might be the only thing anybody can argue about, and that's just personal preference. Did I cover all that pretty much, John? Yeah. All right, so since we're on the suspension subject, let's go over the board of cool things to talk about. On the suspension end, uh, we've got tall knuckle, and we just addressed that. That's the reason for that knuckle being so tall. Drop the loads, allows for the upper pivot to be directly over the tire, giving you zero kinkpin angle, which contributes to very little steering wheel feedback. As Steve is laughing because he loves it when I say knuckle, don't know why. No, it's the dropping loads, I like it. Dropping? dropping. Loads, that's what it was. Thank you, Steve. You're Comic relief you're over there. Parallel arm system. Well, let me get to that one second. Zero kingpin angle we talked about and how that affects everything. Um, body roll, because the kingpin uh, or, or overall knuckle is so tall, because the loads are dropped on that thing, um, both in side loading and uh, in braking, um, you also get a car that turns a lot better. I'm going I'm to I'm call it a car. I don't care what anybody says, UTV or not. It's a car. It's pretty much a race car in my mind. This thing's pretty fast, and it's easy to drive fast. You don't have to really work very hard to do it. Um, body roll is a thing of the past on this vehicle. It does not really have any body roll, but at the same time, it doesn't have that feeling that with too much anti-sway bar on it, you, sometimes when you hit rocks independently, it knocks your head around. It doesn't really do that. You don't get that side-to-side -side kick in this. As you come into a corner, it acts like it's got a ton of sway bar in it, but it really doesn't. It doesn't kick you around. Do you have anything to add to that, John? You were talking about that earlier today. Um, well, <coughs> smart jocks are also going to affect body roll as well. Very true and good point. Because this is a smart shock vehicle, all the sensor inputs are coming into the shock ECU. It knows when you're starting to enter into a corner. It knows when you're on the gas or off. It knows when you're grabbing the brakes. It, can, it has you know, the sensors for yaw. It has uh, accelerometers in it. It knows what you're doing, so it can stiffen the outside shocks as you come into a left-hand corner, you stiffen the right-hand side. Or as you come into a right, it'll stiffen the outside again, left side, so that it doesn't have the body roll that a car that isn't controlled by the computer on the shock side would. So you can run smaller sway bar and not have the body roll when the shock controls that, so that's part of it too. Body roll is awesome on this vehicle for sure. Anything else on that? Nope, cool. All right, par parallel arm. What that means is if you were to, from the front of the vehicle, draw a line between that lower pivot and the outer pivot, whatever that line is, come up to the upper one. And of course we do have the plastics on this thing so you can't see it, but that upper pivot is here and the upper pivot's here. It's pretty much parallel line from the upper arm to the lower arm. A parallel arm system makes it so that the wheel and tire, as it goes through travel, maintains zero camber change. So as it compresses, it doesn't have any camber. It's still vertical or zero camber throughout, even drooped. The only negative to that is that it brings the width of the tire patch or contact patch in at the top, wide at the middle, and narrow at the bottom. That's called scrub width. And when things scrub, tend to, 
typically they don't have as much traction. Sometimes you'll feel that when you turn the wheel and you go through whoops in a corner and the tires are going up and down and they're also going wider and narrower. They're scrubbing as they go through that. Sometimes it'll skip and push and then turn, push, turn, as the tires are contacting everything through whoops. Uh, doesn't seem to be as big of an issue with this when we drove it today as I kind of expected it to be. But one thing that I did feel like, and everybody had mentioned, is if you're going high speed through the whoops, like 50 mile an hour and higher, it can, it can try to walk around on the trail a little bit. I don't think it walks around any more than a Pro R, and, and we actually talked about that, right, Mitch? Um, you had a comment on that. Um, no, I don't think so. Yeah, I think you did. No. All right, well, let me remind you. You said when you drove the Pro R for the first time on the back stretch through the whoops that it was kind of skatey and walked around. Yep. So, I mean, similar to like a Turbo S too, you know. Oh, they, Turbo S is way worse. Had that, had that feeling, I guess. You yeah, could say. I think the Turbo S might be the worst one because the toe in the back change is so bad when it drops out. This does not have any toe issues. The, the toe doesn't seem to change in the back. We have not cycled the front completely to let you guys know if there's any bump steer in the front of this. Um, it doesn't feel like it. There's very little feedback to the front, but we'll let you know. Um, so a little skatey, but it also has a ton of power. So it could just be the fact that we're spinning tires the whole time as well. Um, it's a ton of fun, no matter what, and it's definitely not out of control, and you can control it with two fingers as opposed to a death grip on most cars. So even though uh, we might have pointed that out as a negative, it's a very small negative. And when we get to some of our dislikes, trust me, we're hunting and searching and we're splitting hairs to try and find some of these because the car is pretty badass. Um, anything on suspension while I'm on it? Anybody? Nobody? All right. Anything on comments that you want to address, Tom? Nothing? Uh, Getting to it, okay. How about engine? Let's just scoot, scoot. well, nope, suspension mode since we're on it. Suspension modes, um, in the computer system, you can swap through Comfort, Sport, and Sport Plus. That is basically super plush and soft, a little bit more sporty, a little stiffer, a little bit more controlled, um, and then Sport Plus is turn it up, full throttle, gonna jump some stuff for manly pictures, or uh, this might be comfort for the family and rock crawling, or trail riding, sport might be uh, the family, but um, maybe a lot of weight in the vehicle so that it doesn't have any bottom out at all. Uh, sport Plus, again, full load, all the weight, as fast as you can drive, is kind of where you're gonna wanna have those. The modes are drastically different. You will notice a huge change between each one. They're not just a very small change that you can't, nobody seems to understand if it even makes a difference. You're definitely gonna know. DPS mode, since we're talking on the same deal, so power steering. Power steering, minimum, medium, and max. It, just like it sounds, you've got the least amount of power assist and the most amount of road feel. Um, then you go to basically medium. Medium's gonna give you some more power. You're not gonna two-hand it. You're gonna go to a one-handed, if not two fingers, and max. Max is so much power assist that you can pretty much take one finger and you can whip it one way and whip it the other way. It is a lot of power assist. Unlike X3 models in the past, which had power steering issues, because everybody's shoving a big wheel and tire on it, because people put a wide offset that kicks it out and loads the system even more, there was always an issue with the previous ones of not having enough power assist. And feedback and kickback in the wheel because the power wouldn't cover up those things. There is no issue on this one like that at all. They hit a home run on the power on this and the feedback. So I almost feel like the steering is just better in this car. So the power steering might be the same amount of power, but the steering's better. So maximum isn't needed where, where it is on the you're, X3. Well, you've got a point and you're right. I think that as this kingpin design came in, then you have less feedback because of the lack of kingpin angle. And with less feedback and less load, then the steering is doing a much better job. You won't feel all the things that you typically did in the previous model, right? So then the power assist doesn't have to be as much to accomplish the same thing. Because on my X3, I will put it in max all the all time. All the time, and it's still not enough. And on this one, I can go minimum or medium, and I'm fine. It is, it is a huge difference that I noticed too. And, and uh, honestly, I, I never put it in max. It was too much power, I, I think that kind of lose some of the feel in driving it, especially in a corner. You can't quite feel when it's going to break loose, in my opinion. But minimum and, uh, and medium. Medium was my favorite if you're turning it up. Minimum if you're cruising, for sure. 
or the other way around. I mean, you can go max when you're cruising so that you can have a drink over here and one finger on it, whatever you want. Uh, a water, <clears throat> a liquid, a beverage, whatever that might be. So power steering is awesome. Brakes. So brakes, we have differing opinions on brakes. Um, no doubt these are much bigger. No doubt we've got six piston front, four piston rear, I believe is what's on this model. The rotor is larger. It's definitely um, a more robust piece, more um, truck automotive style than UTV. Um, on the, the car that I drove at the Can-Am event in Havasu, we put uh, about 100, 110 miles or so on it, 250 or 60 mile, an hour, mile runs at a time. And I thought the brakes were awesome. You breathe on them and it stopped. Uh, they were great. But this one, not so much. And I think it is because we had some of the suspension off of it. And uh, maybe we didn't bleed it right. Maybe it needs it a little bit more. But you guys both mentioned that you didn't like the brakes as much as you thought. On my car, which hasn't been touched at all, mm -hmm. I felt like the brakes weren't as good as I expected them to be. Better than an X3, but not as good as you we're hoping for that. My perception was these things have gigantic um, calipers on them yeah. and this thing should stop on a dime and it didn't feel like that to me. But it stops with 32s better than any factory vehicle previous that you've driven unless it had bigger brakes. Would that be fair? I don't know that I'd go that far. Not that far. Mitch, what do you think? I felt they were just super spongy, but like you said, having everything torn apart, it's kind of hard to It, it might to be judge unfair. It, but yeah. And, and that's why we didn't want to put brakes as a negative at all, because I felt like the brakes I drove at the test event were amazing, and the brakes on this one, not so much. So maybe we'll bleed it and we'll let you know. That might be the case. Steve? What, John's age too, reaction time is a lot slower? <laughs> so like, it would have been bad food, so, you know. Highly see. likely. Yeah. <laughs> huh? yeah. <laughs> okay, age plays a factor. We all know that. Um, Let's leave, leave brakes out of this one, okay, you guys? Uh, it, it could just be us. Um, engine and transmission. Let's jump onto that one. Okay, new engine, 1,000 uh, cc, 240 horsepower. I think it might be 245, is it? No, no 240. it's 240. Okay, 240, uh, dual injector per cylinder. So we've got a total of six. Um, the also have a uh, non-centrifugal clutch belt system. We have a dual clutch, uh, seven-speed transmission which is honestly badass. I, I think one of my favorite things about this vehicle is the trans, how the trans works, and how it applies a 240 horsepower to the ground when you're driving the vehicle. The, they seem, all of these things to me, seem very well thought out, very well tested, seamless um, actuation. One thing we bro brought up is 50 to 90 mile an hour acceleration. Okay, in previous X3s, even, for instance, our race cars, which have got a ton more power than 240 horsepower, the f typically as the clutch shifts out, you're going to lose a lot of acceleration. It's going to slow down just a little bit. It still climbs, still goes. Ours are going to go 105 miles an hour or so. But they just don't pull between 70 and 90 miles an hour like they do between 30 and 50. This thing seems to pull about the same from 20 to 40 as it does 50 to 90. The acceleration on the top half of all of that is quite impressive and much, much better than the previous models. Um, I found that that was one of the best things I thought. I mean, we, in our test area, um, usually race car pace on the back stretch is like high 80s, low 90s, and we're dealing with 300 horsepower and a car that'll put up with it. Okay, this thing, bone stock, nothing done to it, untouched this morning, I was 92 miles an hour. And I honestly was not trying to set a record at it. I was just kind of driving it comfortable, seeing what it would do through the big G outs. And at the test in Havasu, I had mine to 95 in some sand washes, really without an issue. You could just be going along at 60 miles an hour, pin it, you're pretty much at 90 in a few seconds, much quicker than you, than you think or anticipate. John? I, I, the way I would describe it is it's deceivingly fast. You, the yes. suspension is is really good and the power that it puts down <clears throat> you get going to the point where you don't think you're going that fast and then you look at the speedometer and you're like and it surprises Crap. you every time like you're comfortable thinking it's 50 you look down at 65 yeah. you're comfortable thinking okay i'm just putting along at 30 or 40 it's 50 or 60 yeah. or more mitch would you say it's as snappy as the x3 power wise 
there's a question about that. So I ride the Oregon Dunes and like how the power is snappy on the X3. It's, it's faster. It, it, it doesn't pencil out number wise to a car this heavy with that much horsepower comparing X3 to Maverick Auto. Power to weight shouldn't power to be weight faster. Between the two, this should not be faster. But everybody I talk to says it is. It, I would agree with you, it definitely is. I think that it, it's much quicker, especially in the middle. Yeah. It may not be drastically fast, seat of the pants feel from zero to 10 or 20 mile an hour, but it seems to me like 30 to 90, 30 to 80 is incredibly faster. And I think that has to do a lot with how the trans applies it yeah. versus a CBT. So trans, seven speed, you can shift from low to high on the fly. You can put it in low gear pin it, it'll shift through all seven speeds. And if you were to continue, it'll automatically get into high no, and it'll, no. it'll have, drop. You have to bang it into high. Okay, let's say you bang it into high as you're going through seven speeds of low, bang it into high, it'll go right to high, which is fourth gear, and it'll shift from fourth through seventh again on high. So you don't have to stop, you don't have to uh, do any of that kind of brain damage, put it neutral and all that good stuff. King of the hammer stuff, that is phenomenal. Night and day not having to stop and, and switch like that. You know, that's, that makes qualifying runs. Like last year's KOH, everybody had to stop and slam it, and you, you hear everything grinding on the yeah, way, and they're banging you it. Slam it wrong, you slam too it wrong, quick blow on stuff the gas up. and yeah, bad noises. And exactly. You just wasted five Awesome seconds. things happen. <laughs> <laughs> Wind chimes all of a sudden shoot out of cars. <laughs> um, Mitch. I like how you can uh, be in not manual mode, if that's correct, right? And yep. then you can paddle shift. If you're in automatic mode, whatever. Mitch, come show, and... show Josh what you're talking about on there. So, so I believe, John, you may have to correct me on this if I'm wrong, but you basically have man, uh, manual mode down here in the center console. It's oh, the M. That would basically be just shifter, uh, paddle shifters, correct? You right? are choosing when it shifts by paddling yourself. So if you keep it out of manual, and let's say you come into a corner, I don't know, you're in fifth gear or whatever, you can downshift, go to fourth, and it doesn't kick it into manual mode. It keeps it into automatic. Mm -hmm. So it will automatically shift out of fifth as you continue driving. So awesome to set up really like that. Yeah, it was, it was cool that you didn't have to play between um, modes, if you will, to get it to go back into automatic mode or manual mode. That was one of my favorite things too, because if you're just let it, because the computer does an awesome job of shifting for you. I think it probably does the best job. It always seems like it's in the right gear yes. in automatic mode, it, always. It does, it does a great job. And if you feel like it, it's realizing you're kind of cruising along, so it's shifting because you're cruising along and it's learned what you're up to. But then all of a sudden you're like, I'm gonna catch up to my buddy really quick and you wanna go ding, ding, ding and downshift it for that corner. You can do that without changing modes or anything. Yeah. Super cool. Yeah. So one of the things that most people don't talk about because people don't talk, always want to talk about going fast, but the normal mode for the engine and transmission is really cool if you just want to cruise on a trail somewhere with your mm -hmm. wife and um, it's going to keep all your RPMs lower. You're going to get better gas mileage. You can just, it's just your cruise mode and it keeps everything way quieter, way better gas mileage, just nice and smooth and mellow and the shifts are all lazy um, just for that it's good thing that you brought that up because the engine modes and transmission modes are basically connected right as you start turning the power up um, you're going to get snappier shifts all that and it's a, it's again uh, just as the suspension modes were a drastic difference between them that engine mode is really really big between cruising like the shifting on the cruise setting is Literally kind of like a Sunday cruise, just brr, brr, really brr. And it's almost like you can feel the clutch engage, brr, brr, right? My sound effects, good. Great. But you turn it up a little bit and those shifts stay in gear longer. Your RPM goes up before it will actually shift and it doesn't have a lazy shift anymore. Now it goes to brr, brr, and it snaps right down to the next spot quick engagement, and then you turn the power all the way up and the shifting is gonna keep that thing in the power range between 7,200 and 8,200 all the time. And it's gonna shift it's spot on, no RPM slippage between all the gears. It's really impressive how it works. And I think a lot of people are gonna find that's one of their favorite things compared to other options. Um, anything on engine and trans, John? No, Do you I wanna just, chat this, about this there? This thing has tons of potential. It, yes, 
Yeah. When, once Huge. Evolution Power Sports, if they're already have their hands on it, but they're going to yeah. be putting out tunes that are beef. E Evo's already gone from, like, within a space of a week, they had 215 horse to the tire uh, on stock, and they're already pl flirting with 250 to the tire stock without much effort, and that's all pump gas. And we were talking a little bit, too, about how Can-Am's probably over-engineered this for all the horsepower levels that are coming in the future. Um, we feel like they've got easy 280 horsepower in this thing three years down the road to get dropped on people, and uh, as they should. But it, it'll put up with it, that, that's for sure. Dom? Do we know anything about the gas mileage? <sighs> John? I can't speak to that because I didn't drive it far enough yet. We did on the media ride on the Vegas Dorino course. Mm -hmm. The problem was we were filling up out of a 55-gallon tank, so we couldn't tell. But looking at the bars, it didn't seem to be using much. I don't know that I trust bars as a, sure. a gauge. But um, it seemed to be doing okay. And there was a lot of guys dri just driving in Sport Plus the entire time. <laughs> so I can tell you on the ride I did in Havasu, I pretty much had the thing in Sport Plus all the time just ripping it. Because they let me go to the back of the line and wait five minutes for everyone to jam off. And then it kind of race up to the back of the line. I was able to do that the whole time. And we put over 100 miles on it and we didn't fill it up. So 100 miles on one tank on this is really impressive because on previous, you're looking at 80, 78 to 85 miles on a four seater per tank, like in kind of like ripping around mode. And maybe as much as 90 if you want to stretch a two seater somewhere on the previous stuff. So it's certainly not doing worse. I think the tank's another gallon or two bigger though. I so. think it's two gallons more. So maybe don't, that's where the extra, extra is, but it certainly isn't doing 80 or 90 miles out of one tank. It was well over 100 and we didn't fill it up. So that's pretty good. So mileage, uh, engine transmission modes, you got normal, sport, and sport plus. Um, today, which was mostly desert, um, we had it in sport just about the whole time. Uh, sport plus is uh, awesome, and it, it is raspy, and it, it definitely puts up some power real quick. It's interesting, um, when you're in normal and sport, it idles like a normal X3. Normal three-cylinder kind of sounds like that purring style as opposed to like a two-cylinder Polaris, which is more of, you know, gurgly or, you know, two-cylinder rasp to it. You put it in Sport Plus, it loses that center cylinder just to after run the turbo up and run the boost up almost from idle, and it gets that raspiness to it. You can feel it shake just a little. You can feel it lose the smoothness and get kind of more angry, and it's night and day on how quick the thing responds. It's very, very powerful, whereas like 60, 80 miles an hour on a straightaway, you can get it in and it's definitely sideways and you, you know you're managing it. So it's a lot of fun. Um, Mitch, anything there? All right, let's go to boring stuff. Interior and electronics. Who cares about all that stuff when you're trying to drive fast, right? I don't, but everybody else seems to. So let's talk about it real quick. So uh, seats. The seats are actually the same seats and mounts as previous X3 models, there's no change on that. It's about the only thing that wasn't changed in, on the full interior package of the vehicle. Personally, I was never really a, good, a fan of the stock seat. I, I don't think um, they have enough cushion to them, and I think they translate a lot of the road feel into your butt cheek. That's the only real thing that I don't like about those, so I'd love to see those change for something that was a little more lazy boy couch-like. Um, Dash switches electronics, kind of all that put together. Mitch, you want to hop in there and kind of point out some of that? Let me open the door, which, oop, cool factor, outside door handle and inside as well. Having both is really bitching instead of having to lean over it all the time. So electronics on these are awesome, touch screen. We didn't even learn near enough about this to tell you anything cool because there's so much to learn. <laughs> But Mitch, try and give you a little bit of a heads up. Uh, yeah, pretty cool. This, I mean, I learned all this this morning too, so a little, little rusty on it. But basically, I believe you can switch through all this with the, with the steering wheel as well. But your main things are all here. So your engine mode, we we're talking about that. Oh, this is probably gonna shut off again. Um, here's your normal, your sport, and your sport plus. The sport plus is what you were just talking about, how it gets raspy and mm -hmm. it, it has tons of power right away. 
Um, you have your suspension, so Comfort, Sport, and then Sport Plus as well, so you can kind of play with both of those and have multiple different changes between those there. Um, power steering, your minimum, medium, and max, um, I believe. Yep. So the steering wheel, you can actually change this with the, the dial here, which is pretty nice as well. Uh, four wheel drive, two wheel drive, four by four trail and four by trail active. Pretty cool. Three different modes on that guy there. And I don't, I'm honestly, I don't know what these last two are, John. Front diff lock, okay. The and then. Is your Engine mode, your shock mode, and your DPS. Okay. So you can kind of have it and all. And you can customize that too. So this, this would basically be having, okay, uh, set up for, for both engine and shock. That's, that's pretty cool. Learning too. as we go. There's yeah. so many modes. <laughs> There's a ton. Um, park neutral, low, manual, and then override. This kind of tripped me out at first, having you know one shifter for reverse and then drive. Mm -hmm. Kind of different there. But then obviously your paddle shifters. You have a smaller screen here. This is kind of your main main hub, if you will, oh, of everything. Steering wheel, uh, tilt and telescope. Yep. Tel Telescoping's huge. That's awesome. Pulls in and out, just up, whatever you want there. One thing we did Headlight find switch. out last night is uh, if you run out of gas, you, if we could not find a way to put it in neutral without the car being started because we wanted we, to roll yeah, it forward. It seemed like it had to be running in order for it to be in neutral. So you couldn't may, maybe if neutral. someone could tell us how to do that, that'd be yeah, awesome. It might be in the manual, which uh, dudes don't read. Yeah. <laughs> so it's probably in there, but we didn't figure it out. Right. Well, it's pretty cool. I mean, it's laid out really, really well. I mean, well, um, the vision inside is awesome. Like yeah. the, over the hood right here, the normal X3s, that, that's a lot taller. It's not as flat. This is you can't set your helmet on there. Way. That's for sure. It's much the vision better. out of it's killer. Um, out the sides are great. A full door. Super cool, instead of having the hole in the bottom of the door for mud to come through. Um, it does not, negative though. Stock, uh, though, storage is like almost non-existent. Yeah, it's very low Glove on the storage is, side. There's pretty much everything and they're super, not very big. That, that's all you got. They, uh, can -Am has lots of accessories, upper and lower door bags and some cool stuff in the back, but stock, there's, it's pretty, uh, but it looks bitchin', so who cares about what you're putting in the glove box, right. John? Perfect. It's um, got a Bluetooth charger, so that's there. There is a lot in this. Now, we're kind of skipping over a few things uh, since you're sitting in the front. I'll come up to the front. Um, we're skipping over a couple of things on this. Uh, there are a ton of accessories from Can-Am. You can get stereos for the roof. The roofs pop up, so the speakers are blasting your friends. You've got trunk space. You've got uh, com compartments that at can all fit together to create big storage areas, spare tires. We've got mirrors, you've got lights, you've got smart lights for these, where as speed increases, the lights go from a flood to a spot. Um, these are, and they also turn with a steering sensor. It'll turn into a corner like some high-end road cars. There's a ton of stuff like that that you can get with these, and I think that Canon did a good, great job on setting all that up. We just don't have all that here to show you, and. Honestly, we don't really care about trunk space with the stuff that we normally do, so you should look into it if you do. Um, what else is on our board of treats? How about we talk about new products before we go into the last list that everybody wants, which is likes and dislikes. Steve. That's what I was going to say, Justin. You talked about all those accessories. What kind of accessories do we have to offer? Good. Mitch. Good, uh, yeah. So, uh, Mitch, why don't you take over? And uh, point out some of the stuff that you've been working so hard on the last couple of weeks that we currently have ready to go and coming out in the next week or two. Yep. Um, pretty much, I mean, I guess we can start at the front, but our normal stuff that we always kind of do, a uh, couple differences. Uh, front sway bar links, a little tricky because those are very small from factory because they can get into the boot. So we got to kind of play with that a little bit and get that dialed in there. Um, but those are ready to go. Everything's good there. That is going to come with hardware that is much better than the factory stuff. So upper and lower that connects to the bar. Um, we have front limit straps coming. I see a strap on the front. Yep, we do have front straps coming. That is uh, You're welcome. <clears throat> worked out perfectly on that. I'm not mm -hmm. going to lie. <laughs> um, other than that, we got uh, our billet resi caps for the front and the rear. Um, just a nice little bling addition, if you will. And you got some cool stuff on the back, don't you? Yeah, the back's where all the goodies are at. Uh, rear limit straps as well. So that's gonna be an option. Um, 
pretty cool the first car that we're going to have front and rear limit straps right normally <laughs> all the new cars it's like a front strap first the rear is kind of a bitch yep so yep. it worked out on that side of it we got rear links and then these are my favorite all of our uh, radius rods so inch and a quarter big stuff three quarter rod ends um looks cool kind of keeps with our standard um billet design if you will kind of ties everything together we will also have chromoly versions of that here pretty soon the billet ones are what we started with because they typically take a little bit longer for us. So we jammed on them first, so you guys will have them faster. Um, taking a look at that toe link, uh, where it attaches to the spindle right now, we actually have uh, a pin mount already designed on the vehicle. Here's one in my hand. And this is heat treated and plated material already ready to go for that toe link. We will also have this assembly in double shear. So there'll be an outside plate that locks on to the outside of that pin mount. As you see, it's right there. There'll be a whole full bracket that attaches to the spindle and allows you to still maintain the factory rock guard for the wheel, keeping uh, rocks and things from ripping the uh, calipers apart or busting up the wheel. So all that is happening right away as fast as we can. Give us a couple of weeks and we'll have announcements and some more media when that stuff goes on the website. But we also have stuff that's not on the car yet that we're in the middle of doing, right Mitch? Yep. What do you got over on the bench? Uh, we got tie rods we're doing, since we finished driving it today, we're gonna start working on spring kit stuff, uh, internal valving, making, making all that stuff nice, making so it. New spring packages are already in the works. They're actually gonna go on the vehicle after this feed. Mm -hmm. uh, we were trying to keep it as stock as possible for all of our testing to talk to you guys about our review but now we're gonna start making some changes. So spring kits, shock internals. Uh, there's a tie rod. That is not a tie rod for this car. It's just a tie rod to show you that we're working on them. And the tie rod that we're making for this car is gonna have a BSD adjustable uh, system so you can get rid of bump steer if there is some in this. We have not checked it, can't tell you. The reason that we haven't checked it is because we're in the middle of making our own alignment plates for this lug pattern and offset because we wanted to be very accurate and not measure off the tire. Um, other stuff that we're doing is mostly secret. secret, but there are a ton of electronics, live systems that we're going to be adding to this, um, some of which you've seen us testing on other vehicles that we'll also have for this as well. Um, steering, 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 yes. Steering, yep. Um, so we have a lot of stuff available right away in the next few weeks. We've got more coming shortly after, but we're headlong onto this, and uh, hopefully we told you guys a little bit about this in the areas that you wanted to know when it comes to what you're thinking about, how and why you would buy one of these. Hopefully we help that out. Um, it, it basically, the car is badass. It really, really is. It does so many things really well um, and probably does so many things better than any other OEM vehicle ever released. What most people probably want to know is how does it compare to a Pro R? Well, we have experience on both of those, and I've got racing experience uh, in a Pro R. I've got, you know, some pre-runner stuff, like 5,000 miles of pre-run miles on a Pro R, and all the testing that we've we've done. I think that they do different things better uh, than each other. I think that this Maverick R is it excels in turning, it excels in quickness, the acceleration out of a corner. It, it excels at excelling, accelerating. Yeah, yeah. But um, uh, the, the, the corner speed that this vehicle carries is really impressive. And then how the trans puts that power down on leaving a corner is even more impressive to go from 30 mile an hour exit speed to 60 mile an hour in you know, one or two seconds max. So I think where most driving happens and a lot of mainly most racing happens, this one is probably faster than a Pro R. But, I think where a Pro R excels is when things get really big and rough. When one foot whoops turn into two footers and bigger, um, then I think a Pro R might have the handle or the advantage there. But a Pro R is and feels heavier to drive uh, than, than this does. And I think that they are both about 2,200, 2,300 pounds. So it, it's not, it's about the same, but this does not drive heavy. It drives very light. It, to me, it drives like an 18 or 1900 pound car. It does not feel like it's carrying all that extra weight at all. Whereas a Pro-R feels heavy and lumbersome, cumbersome in a corner a little bit. 
maybe a little top heavy compared. Um, I think that uh, this one really, really excels in the cornering and acceleration side of things. Pro R is when it gets big. That's kind of my take. We'll see though. You know, we're, we're a lot of guys are building some fast Pro R's, and we'll, when it comes to racing against each other, there'll be no way you can hide it. You'll find out which ones are quicker in different races, pretty fast. But uh, this thing's awesome, very much. Very, very. It's everything I think everybody wanted it to be. Dom, you had some? Yeah. Ty Spencer is asking. Are the A-arm shocks mount, shock mounted in the front double sheared? Yes, um, everything on this vehicle is double sheared unlike X3s in the past. And it, except for the tow link in the rear on the radius rods, which we will be making our kit double sheared, but that's about the only thing on this vehicle that is not. And I just wanted to point out to people that driving this thing on the inside in the cab it is super quiet. There's no more clutch noise. Very good point. It is. So quiet inside, it's really nice. Turbo Tesla. Turbo Tesla. A Turbo Tesla. <laughs> yeah. you, th you thought it was a, a turbo electric car. I literally, f it felt like it was electric the first time I got it when I drove it this morning. I was like, this thing, this, <laughs> it's so quiet. Like it literally it, cycles through everything and does not make a noise. All the arm system is super quiet. Yeah. What's the name of the joint that they're running? A double bonded yep. arm joint or pivot point joint? I forget the name of it, but. Double bonded bushing, I believe. Something like that. Something like that. Um, whatever the name of this new cool, cool trick bushing is, it definitely is quiet. There's really no noise in the front suspension movement, um, unlike a ton of vehicles we drive. Yeah. And uh, the fit and finish is much nicer on the inside. The doors are, are much more substantial. Handles on them, they don't rattle, they don't shake. Um, and I, I didn't find anything else in, in this thing that was really upsetting me on a noise side. It was really nice. And yeah, you mentioned doors. Yep. Um, I don't see why anybody would put an aftermarket door on this. They're that good. It does have a really good line. You know, I think after we wrapped this, the, the lines really became even more apparent, I think. Like it wasn't hidden with all the black. And now you can see what's going on. Um, I, I dig it. It's pretty cool. Justin, who did this sick ass wrap? This wrap done by Wolf Designs in, uh, in Phoenix. So hit them up if you guys like it. Um, what other questions have you guys got before we get into our likes and dislikes? going to take this car to Baja? Absolutely. Every car we have goes to Baja. It's the only place we can test everything for real and try and blow it up for real. Multiple days, many miles, thousands of miles. Um, I mean, so the Pro-R rolls pretty good. I'll figure out if this one does, possibly. <laughs> Isn't that kind of a fly? <laughs> that one rolled really well, Turtle. so we'll see if this one does. <laughs> All right, so uh, how it compares to a Pro-R, we talked about that. Likes and dislikes. Take a look at this list. Okay, our likes are pretty much every single thing that we talked about on this video. Our dislikes, we kind of had to split hairs and search for things that we didn't like, okay? So it's not even a crappy list. It's just things where we would wish it would have. On the likes, we love the power. Power and the car is quiet. It's super quick. The ground clearance is great. We don't find ourselves dragging over, you know, bigger rocks than normal that we would expect. Well, you got a crown in the road, you can bottom the car out on a crown and it doesn't drag it because it's got ground clearance even when it's fully bottomed out. The k and engineers said that we've got three inches in the back, four inches in the front. That is super cool. It feels really solid. It doesn't feel solid because it weighs 2,250 pounds. It feels solid because everything in it seems to be tight. Nothing is rattling, the frame doesn't seem to flex around, doors aren't falling off. It just feels Solid. Everything about the car is beefier, too. But all, all the nuts yes. and bolts and everything, it, it's all bigger. Now you went from 10 and 12 millimeter hardware. It's a pretty standard issue, 14 mil on all this stuff, right, Mitch? Yep. Uh, yeah. All the shock hardware is 14 mil. Sway bar stuff still 12, but, I mean, bigger hardware is still 12 millimeter on, on sway bar is good. Yeah. Um, everything's really nice. It turns incredibly. You can whip this thing into a corner, carry way more speed. Like, perfect example. A, a race rutted corner in a sand wash that normally you're stuck in. And if you take it a little bit too hot, you're not gonna go out of the corner, you're just gonna bike it. It just doesn't seem to do that. It, you, can, you can go in way too hot and it doesn't pick up the inside tire. So body roll and turning, body roll is minimal, turning is super fast. The trans is very impressive and one of the most impressive things in my mind on this list. Getting rid of a belt and the fact that it works so good, unbelievable. Stable, part of the turning we talked about. Stable in all the uh, suspension modes. Stable in the transmission modes. Well, in footprint, mm -hmm. width and wheelbase. Overall wheelbase and width, John. It's a good size. Stability. 
um, mm -hmm. for Dooms rock crawling, even when I was on the Rubicon testing mm -hmm. it, it felt great, you know, coming up on a, a climb without having to square up the length and everything makes it feel way more stable. Yep. Um, so stability with width and wheelbase, as John had mentioned, steering and feedback, kind of the same way, way more improved over previous years. Tons of power steering assist, uh, less feedback or kickback that normally would rip the wheel out of your hands. It's gone. Thing of the past. You can drive with fingers instead of both hands. Uh, shifting, just forget about it. Let it do it. It does such a good job. It's, it's quite impressive. And how the clutch engages for you is, is programmed so well, you basically don't even know that it's happening. Very impressive. Electronics, I like that it has so much stuff that we have to learn and read the book to understand how it works. The book, the manual book thing, those words with letters and print that I'll probably never ever read. I'll just fumble my way through touching things until I figure it out. But I just that stuff, that. You, like you did, Mitch, yeah. <laughs> but that is cool. Dislikes, well, on previous models, as John had mentioned, we used to have temperature you know, to our gauges, for instance, engine temp and belt temp, right, John? An actual number. A number, as, a, as opposed to a bar graph. Yeah, 206 you know, yeah. Fahrenheit for your engine coolant. Now all you have is a bar graph. So you would prefer the numbers. I would prefer the numbers as and, opposed to just I bars. And I want to know my transmission temp. Yeah. I don't care that it it's not a belt. should never overheat. I right. still want to know. Yeah. Just one of those things that I want to know. I wonder if it's in there. We just haven't dug through electronics to find it. It's absolutely in there somewhere, somewhere. but it's not, <laughs> it hasn't so surfaced. Is this really a dislike? It's just us bitching because John's old. Um, <laughs> yeah, seats. Wow. Now even, <laughs> even Justin's doing it. So uh, seats. Uh, again, that's my complaint. I just, I just, I'm you're not a, old. Yeah, there it is. I'm old and I, I just want super comfy seats, man. I'm sorry. Um, an oh shit button. We didn't talk about it, but man. The one cool thing that this is missing that we all want is a button on the steering wheel to go full stiff when you go too fast into the biggest hole ever you didn't expect, or make a big mistake, or jump something, it's crooked and it's coming nose in. You want to hit that button, go full stiff, not bottom out. I wish this had it. It has everything else. It wouldn't take much to do it. That would be on, on my wish. I know it's on John's wish list. Well, and I specifically asked the Can-Am guys about that uh, at the media event, and in their defense, they said that the electronics in this are so smart that you don't need it. They might be. I still want it. Right. Got to have it. <laughs> no, no. I want a big, giant red one, like almost going to punch easy it. Easy to reach. Right. Something. So, uh, brakes. Again, it's not a dislike yet because I think we're being a little overcritical, not knowing how good or bad they are. I thought the one that I drove before was awesome. You guys didn't like this one. And I do think this one doesn't have as good of brakes as the previous one I drove. So let's play with it before we you know, set our mind on that. John had a good point. We have all this cool transmission stuff, and they didn't put a launch mode in it. But YXZ has launch mode. Ooh, Ooh and I think doesn't. that's, you definitely zingered them right there. Um, when it does so much other stuff, we just, we want one. Evolution's going to have it, but. Oh, yeah. It's going to happen here pretty quick. We really want one. Tire rub, last thing. Well, there's a lot of flex in this tire. Moving around with what we did, we actually can see a little rubbage on the inside of the spindle. And that's just the stock wheel and tire. So, honestly, who cares? Everybody's going to change a wheel and tire. Everybody's going to change a wheel. Um, and, and you're going to have probably a stiffer sidewall design and you'll never see it happen again. I didn't hear it, Rob. I, never. I never noticed it at all. We just noticed the color and that's it. Are those really dislikes? Honestly, it's just the only thing we could find. It's the only thing we could come up with. There isn't much else. That's kind of impressive because usually we're really good at pointing out a bunch of screwed up stuff. Haven't found it yet so far. Another, well, one other potential uh, dislike. Mm. I felt in the dunes that on um, transitions, um, it would bottom out too easy. Mm -hmm. Side by side blog guys as well have mm -hmm. seen the same thing. We haven't taken this one to the dunes. Right. So we need to do a little bit more testing on that to confirm. Um, and we will do that and have that Next as week. part of our spring yep. and valving package. 
We will do a lot of testing. It'll be in the dunes next. After we do our spring and internals here and desert terrain, we're going to go straight to the dunes. We'll do all that. We're going to be doing some rock crawling. We'll be in uh, Sand Hollow. Sand Hollow in, a, in two weeks. Uh, we're one gonna, week. One, sorry, one week. Time's coming together. Um, but we're going to have it everywhere. We're going to have setups for everybody. And we're going to have you know super slow, plush stuff for guys on the East Coast, kind of trail spec. We'll have that as well. So don't worry. We'll have a lot for you after we're done. Dom. Uh, Britt Davis is asking, how similar slash different are the shocks between the Pro R and the Maverick R, Smart Shock versus Dynamics, all stock? Um, I think that these do as good a job as a Pro R. Pro R shocks do as good a job as these do. Um, but I think that these do a better job cornering than the Pro R suspension system does, whether that's a shock specific reason or not, we're not sure. There's a lot that goes into that. But I feel like these are tuned better for smaller things to keep the tire on the ground, traction in a corner, whereas the Pro R is tuned for bigger stuff that you can just blow through and not feel. So two different directions, but they do both are extremely good at it. But from a live valve perspective, the one thing uh, Polaris does is their different modes um, change rebound and compression mm -hmm. in some of those. Like Baja will add a certain amount of rebound right. as well, specific to what they think that terrain is, where this just um, has you know soft, medium, and firm kind of um, shock settings. Well, I think that the shock algorithm does change the rebound as you go through those settings because the, the valve on the piston in this, I'm not, we didn't take this apart to show you guys, but there is an external live valve, um, basically magnet like the Pro-R has on the bridge, one, uh, whereas the Pro-R has two, a rebound and a, com and a compression. Uh, there's one on this, and then there is one valve on the piston internally. The one on the piston internally is controlling rebound, the one on the bridge is controlling compression. So they do control both of those separately. What we don't know is how much rebound has changed as you go from soft, medium, and stiff. Whereas on a Pro R, you can see that they're definitely changing the rebound settings as you choose terrain. And that all could be just perception in me yeah. looking at the cute little screen and going, oh, it's changing my rebound. Shiny thing. Where look at me. this isn't telling me they're doing it, it's just doing it. Right. Um, but to answer his question, Dom, I think that this kills it, and so does a Pro R. They're just better at different areas. Um, any other questions before we sign out of here? Uh, so w one other negative um, from my perspective, and I know a lot of other people have uh, an issue with it, is the C-pillar doesn't go anywhere. It doesn't tie into the frame in the right. back. Right. Um, in Can-Am's defense, they've done all their testing, and they say it isn't needed. The C-pillar mm -hmm. is only needed for their accessories. I, I would love to see it tied into the ch chassis itself. Um, I would but too, but I'd also defend them too. They, they, you know, they, you can, they've done all the testing. Right. I mean, you can lose a C-pillar altogether and it's still pass test. Yes. So you know, as far as safety is concerned, we're not too concerned. But I like seeing things terminate and not just end in space too. Yeah. But ha back, how about we finish this with this? On our likes and our dislikes, these likes are massive in size. We, the power, trans, steering, performance, turning, uh, stable, solid feel, shifting, feedback into the steering wheel, all of these things are like deal enders in most vehicles when they're not done well. And all of these are done really, really well in this vehicle. Our dislikes, again, we're just splitting hair, hairs here. We'd love to have difference in gauges, C-pillars ending in, in different places, launch modes and things that we really want like, oh shit buttons. But there isn't anything that would keep me from buying this thing, ever. There is a ton of stuff that would make me buy it on the light column, and I think that's really the takeaway here after driving it quite a bit. Would you agree with that? Uh, the way I put it is this is better than an X3 in every way except for the price. Well, it's a this lot. This one's 45 and change. And then the Expensive. lesser models are in the mid-30s? The lowest end model is like 35. So 35 to 45, yeah. or 35, 42. I think that I think these are uh, on average about a thousand to two thousand more, depending on the model, than a Pro R. 
So if you guys can afford it, then it's badass. If you can't afford it, it's still badass. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> right? <laughs> but what about the trees getting stuck in this thing? I don't ever see that being an issue, trees getting stuck in the spindle. I No. No, no, no. You have to drive upside down to get stuff stuck in that upper arm spindle, I think. But uh, Mitch, Dom, it's your last chance. All right? Nope. Done. All right. John. Before, no, wait, not wait, anymore, John. I'm trying we, to leave. Before we leave, we got a couple of the other things happening in okay. the next week. Well, you we're do have stuff be. on the schedule, don't you? Um, we will be at UTV Takeover next week, Sand Hollow. We'll have our merchandise trailer there um, with all that stuff. I got it all in my okay, brain. Okay, <laughs> After that, we're going to have our service trailer in Glamis doing all the appointments and everything, and we may have a couple appointments left. Call the shop. Yep. 623-217-4959. He nailed, he nailed it. And, and Legends the, of the same week, we're going to be in Havasu for the uh, American Side-by-Side -side Takeover. Which, which is, is the Legends at Havasu. Run by Mid America, Mid America Outdoors. Outdoors, which means Outdoors. you guys know it's going to be a party because those guys definitely throw one all the time. And John is over here showing off John, because his his exit was so good. <laughs> Where do they go to buy any of these products you just spoke of? Dub 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 shocktherapyusa.com. Dub dub dub. Wow. Dub dub son. Definitely with the. I don't know, Steve, but you guys, thank you very much for tuning in. Hopefully, this helped you. Uh, not quite a full tilt review, just to this point with what we've done, trying to let you know what we think. Hopefully it's helped. Tune in when we've got some more stuff coming after we've done some dune testing and we have more products for this vehicle. For now, thanks again. We'll see you guys soon. I like the dub, dub, dub. dub, dub, dub.